Okay, well, welcome back to the uh, Indigenous Climate Justice Symposium. Uh, thanks for coming on such a beautiful day. Even if you're uh, students that have to be in class, thank you for coming. <laughs> Didn't really have to play hooky. Um, this is going to be a panel on fossil fuel resistance. And um, a couple of announcements. One is that if you haven't registered, please register at the table. We also have a program with everyone's bios on it. And also, for the next few minutes at least, we're, we're going to play a, a very short music video. And during that, uh, for the next few minutes, the bookstore is still selling uh, copies of the book that was published by our project, The Climate Change and Pacific Rim Indigenous Nations Project here at Evergreen. Um, a few years ago, Oregon State University Press published an anthology that was partly uh, the work of tribal MPA students and MES students and, um, and dignitaries from uh, indigenous nations in Washington, BC, Alaska, New Zealand. And um, they're gonna be selling that back at the table in the back for at least the next few minutes. Um, and so if you wanna stop in and get a book, uh, that informs you of our work. We're, to set the mood, we're going to play um, a short video by a young um, Sliamen First Nation um, citizen, Takaya Blaney, uh, who was 12 years old when this video was made. We showed it in our class, but this is a different version. And um, this is a song that uh, she calls Shallow Waters, which is about the uh, Alberta tar sands and the um, uh, some of what we're going to be hearing about today, the pi oil pipelines that would be bringing oil down to the Sailor Sea to be loaded into oil tankers. And uh, um, this is her take on that proposal and what she, as uh, a young indigenous woman, thinks about it. So this is Shallow Waters by Takaya Blaney. Ocean black not blue. 
your clear waves slapping at my feet. Pretty powerful statement uh, from Takaya Blaney. Uh, she's also played a really important role in the I Don't Know More movement in Canada that we might uh, be hearing uh, some about in the next uh, couple hours or uh, hour and a half. Um, so I'm Zoltan Grossman. I'm on the faculty at Evergreen since uh, 2005 in Geography and Native Studies and part of uh, the Climate Change and Pacific Rim Indigenous Nations Project. Um, and uh, really working lately with indigenous nations that are fighting in the Pacific Northwest and elsewhere, uh, fossil fuel extraction, and especially the Achilles heel of the fossil fuel industry, which is shipping. Because all the oil and coal is bound up in these three interior basins, uh, Powder River Coal Basin, Bakken Oil Shell Basin, and the Alberta Tar Sands and they need to use rail and pipelines uh, to get the fossil fuel out to the coasts and also um, use the same port facilities like here in Olympia to get equipment and supplies into the fossil fuel basins in order to extract that fossil fuel. So our port of Olympia is implicated in uh, Bakken oil fracking uh, because of some of the supplies coming through there. And all along the way there's been resistance and it's been led by native nations. And we all, we non-natives really owe it to the, non -na to the native nations in this area. If, the, if they hadn't fought, fought for their treaty rights here in Washington, if they hadn't fought for their nationhood and aboriginal rights across the border in British Columbia, our environment, our economies would be much more destroyed than they are now. And so they're leading the way in not only, as we're talking about today on Thursday, um, resisting fossil fuels and in that way trying to mitigate climate change, but also leading the way in what we're going to be talking about tomorrow, which is building resilience in uh, those communities and providing models for non-native people on how to adapt and how to respond to the inevitable climate change that is happening because of the fossil fuels that have already been burned. And uh, there are some indigenous nations, as we're uh, going to see today, that are facing both the fossil fuels and are facing the effects on salmon, treaty resources, sea level rise that are caused by the burning of the fossil fuels. So really a double whammy. And uh, in that way, there's double resistance and double resilience. So we want to welcome um, the panelists today. It's a little bit different order than in your uh, program. We're going to start out uh, first with Tyson Johnston, who is vice president of the Quinault Indian Nation in Tahola. So welcome, Tyson. <laughs> He's been a tribal spokesperson and key advocate in opposition to fossil fuel development in the Pacific Northwest for several years. We're going to be hearing in particular about the Grays Harbor oil terminals. He's held elected office with the Quinault Indian Nation since March 2011, where he's been a policy lead in natural resources, self-governance, and intergovernmental relations. And then the second speaker... Uh, that we're glad to have here is Nancy Shippentower Games, who grew up on the banks of the Nisqually River with her parents, Donald McLeod, who's Puyallup, and Janet McLeod, who's Tulalip. Her father's parents are Willie Frank and Angela Tobin. Uh, her mothers are Mammy McCoy and John Reniker. She lives in Yelm, Washington, and grew up in the fishing wars on both the Nisqually and Puyallup Rivers. She graduated from college at at the Evergreen State College under the direction of Mary Ellen Hilaire, who has really been instrumental in founding the college and in particular native programs at the college and the longhouse, um, uh, envisioning the longhouse that we're in today. Uh, Nancy has worked at the Puyallup tribe off and on for 30 years, mainly in natural resources jobs. She was on Puyallup Tribal Council during the land claims settlement and signed the 1989 Centennial Accord between the tribes and the state um, that Michael Vendiola referred to earlier this morning. 
and she's very vocal when it comes to protecting treaty rights and tribal natural resources. Then our third speaker, and welcome to Nancy. <laughs> our third speaker is Roxanne Murray, who's a Tacoma award-winning artist who received her BA in Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences with a certificate of high scholarship from UW Tacoma in 2009. Her ancestors are Assiniboine Sioux and they grew up on the Fort Peck Reservation in Montana. She grew up in the backwoods of Graham, Washington, has had a strong bond with the natural world since when she was a child, which encouraged her to fight for environmental justice. When Roxanne is not documenting and engaging in community-based activism, she takes photographs while traveling. She's documented several issues in the Philippines, the Marshall Islands, Costa Rica, Thailand, and Bali, having to do, like here, with colonization, overdevelopment, and climate change. So welcome, Roxanne. And our last speaker um, comes from um, north of here, Cedar George Parker, is a member of the Tulalip tribes located on C Coast Salish territory in the US and the tsleil First Nation in North Vancouver, British Columbia. He's worked for many years with his parents to protect the lands of the tsleil Nation and the Tulalip tribes from the Kinder Morgan pipeline and other threats to Coast Salish territory. Cedar travels internationally, participating in climate solutions meetings with indigenous peoples throughout the world. He recently visited Australia and Aotearoa, which is New Zealand, and stood with the Standing Rock Sioux against the Dakota Access Pipeline, which we're gonna be talking about in the next session. He has also spoken at the United Nations and met with the Canadian government in Ottawa that I'm sure we're gonna be hearing something about. So welcome to Cedar. So first, I'd like to welcome Vice President Johnston. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me all right. First off, I want to acknowledge the Medicine Creek Treaty Tribes for allowing us to be on their territory today. I know some of your descendants are in the audience, and they're in this building with us to witness this work. My name is Tyson Johnston. I'm the Vice Chair of the Quinault Indian Nation. And these last five years, um, my tribe has been intricately involved in opposing fossil fuels in the Pacific Northwest. But to give a little history of my nation, um, we're a signatory to the Quinault River Treaty that was signed on July 1st, 1855, preceding Washington statehood. But we've been organized as a people well before this nation state even existed. We keep that in mind in all of our government to government work that we do at the state, regional, national, and international levels. My tribe's the largest employer in Grace Harbor County, which is in um, Northwest Washington State on the coast. I'm not sure how familiar you are with the area, but just north of Ocean Shores. Um, we're a treaty tribe that have adjudicated treaty rights in Grace Harbor on several river systems on the reservation and off the reservation. We've been actively involved in tribal fisheries um, since their inception. We're co-managers with the state of Washington and negotiate internationally our tribal allocation of treaty fish every year. And we're also actively involved in the work that's happening with tribes adapting and mitigating climate change as it's affecting our lands and territories today. These last several years have been very challenging because it's been our indigenous territories that have been uniquely vulnerable and susceptible to these fossil fuel industries and their plans um, to extract from the earth. Uh, in Grays Harbor, there was three oil companies that were proposing to do crude by rail transport um, coming from all over into our territory. This is hugely problematic to us because we enjoy our treaty fishery as well as access to our natural resources and do that together with our communities. If you're familiar with where I'm from, a lot of jobs, resources are all based off of that natural resources economy. And the way that these companies have tried to come in and supplant that with promise of jobs, uh, economic stimulation is really false. And so as a tribe, we've taken every tool in our toolbox to try to address this, whether um, working directly with the cities that have the ultimate permitting authority as well as working all the way up um, to the executive branch and the federal government, letting them know that this is an issue and as our trustee, you need to help us protect our lands and territories and water. 
we were successful in staving off that development. Um, initially, these companies um, painted themselves as uh, sustainable uh, oil use only, like biofuels, things like that, uh, animal oils, vegetable oils, but later added on um, their crude by rail proposal later in that process. This allowed them to work through the State Environmental Protection Act only, because the other things we've heard about, like what's happening at Standing Rock and Lummi Nation, have gone through the federal process at the national NEPA level. But because that this is um, done the way I explained, um, it's really contained to the state and the local jurisdictions that have that decision-making authority. So it's a whole different set of protocols and learning that system. Um, initially, they issued a finding of non-significant uh, impact, trying to uh, basically say that these proposed uh, oil terminals wouldn't impact the environment significantly. And so us, being very vigilant in everything that comes into our ter territory, said that no, there is gonna be a significant impact and there needs to be a higher standard applied to these projects. Um, we took them to court, we were successful in that argument and they had to do a full environmental impact statement process, an EIS, which was recently completed a few months ago. Um, my tribe, our Department of Natural Resources, our allies in the community, we submitted thousands and thousands of pages of comments, analyzing everything from air quality to uh, the impacts on the riverbeds and the sensitive ecosystems, treaty rights, um, how it would access our, our access to our fisheries. And in that report, it was very explicit that they can't fully mitigate away these issues, that um, there's nothing you could do with oil response or whatever measures they put in place to fully um, mitigate away these problems. And so it was there in black and white. And so we work closely um, with our partners to go directly to the decision makers urging the uh, city of Hoquim and the Washington Department of Ecology to effectively stop these in their tracks because it was very clear after scientific analysis that this was not safe. We have the second oldest rail infrastructure in the United States. Um, all these issues that are there, I mean, within the last uh, year alone, there was probably three or four derailments in my area, and luckily they just transport things like, like rocks, grain, things like that, but it's right there on populated you know, areas right next to schools and businesses, and um, the thought of actually going through an oil spill or um, disastrous level things, um, we're not prepared for that as our communities, and we, we won't um, ever be because those impacts far extend our life. Um, we've worked as co-managers of our resource for decades, long before I was born, to restore our natural resources. Um, my territory was decimated in the 40s and 50s and 60s from terrible logging practices, and we've worked for these last um, 30 or 40 decade or 30 or 40 years to restore those rivers and river systems and forests so we can manage them sustainably and also you know have jobs that are created from a sustainable practice uh, within our forest within our rivers um, within our natural resources um, we went through that process and even still um, the decision makers are very scared of those oil companies um, and I think even when we first started getting into this, there's that fear that's there. These people have a lot of money, their influence extends far beyond, and so how can us as one tribe really stand up and make a difference? But when you look at the Constitution of the United States, our treaties that predate statehood in a lot of cases are the supreme law of the land. It's, it's a legal hammer that we could use to really enforce and protect our way of life. And, the spirit when that, those things were written. Um, they're supposed to reflect all these things within that trust responsibility that my tribe should be able to enjoy forever and ever in exchange for ceding millions of acres of land to the United States so it can exist today. And so these type of projects put our treaty rights at risk. After um, we went through that process and we're at a standstill with the decision makers, we started working this from all other angles as well. Um, we found out about this law, the Ocean Resources Management Act, um, that 
was adopted here in Washington several years ago that was meant to protect ocean coastline and marine waters from development such as this. Our leaders back then had that foresight when that original law was passed to preempt projects such as this coming forward. And so we worked with our partners with Earth Justice and other community groups to effectively sue this through the state and the local jurisdictions that the Ocean Resource Management Act should apply to projects such as the ones that are proposed in Grace Harbor. We argued every level, and I actually, we were denied um, at the district level and the, the appellate level, but by the time it got to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court actually sided with the Quinault Nation and Earth Justice and our community partners and said that ORMA should apply to projects such as those proposed in Grace Harbor. After that happened, it effectively um, stalled them permanently. The companies and their proposed developments will never reach those um, strict standards that are under the Ocean Resources Management Act. And so we take that as a victory, but we're still cautious because there's other ways that could be changed. Even this year in session, we've been actively doing work in Olympia um, to preempt any legislative, um, um, what's a nice way of saying it, a gutting of that bill because those companies have been working with our local decision makers at um, the state legislative level to gut that decision through the legislative process. And so we've really been active um, on that level to make sure that doesn't happen. But worldwide though, and thinking of this at a global and macro level, um, we feel at Quinault what we're going through there is just as connected as what happens at Lummi Nation, what's happening to our First Nations brothers and sisters in Canada, um, what's happening in Standing Rock. Um, we had a delegation of folks um, go over to Standing Rock and support them the whole time that was going on. Um, we participated in the paddle on the Missouri River. We brought over two canoes because we really view that anything that happens there will affect us here at home. That web of life that was mentioned earlier, um, we believe in that, that's our teachings. And so we, we stand firmly in solidarity with all of our communities that are facing that. We work closely with Lummi Nation and formed a Northwest Alliance of Tribes because all of us are, seem to be going through these issues together and it just becomes more powerful and um, it makes you feel less alone when you have those allies and people that stand with you. And it's heart-wrenching to see that what has been allowed to go on. Um, this, there's been a lot of positive things we've been able to do, but there's pipelines that are not talked about. Uh, there's terrible environmental degradations that have already happened, and it's only been these last few decades that tribes have been able to amass their political power to really effectuate change here in our area as well as abroad. Um, and really thinking of our future generations, there's things today that, that we have to do actively to make sure years down the road, we don't have to explain to them what our salmon tastes like. You know, there's been times in, in my history where if our tribe didn't step in and try to protect these salmon species and try to um, fix these forest practices, there'd be um, unique species of salmon that would be extinct right now without our intervention. And so those type of things are issues that we take very seriously. I mean, we relate this issue to the what's going on with climate overall. Our environment's changing, and I think there's more consensus on that now, even though there's still naysayers, but indigenous communities are often on the front lines of that. Where I live, right on the coast, you know, we deal with ocean sea level rise. Um, we deal with more severe weather and landslides. Um, our elders and our teachings are are showing us that we're out of balance and there's something happening right now. And until we recognize our relationship with the world, even the intangible one that we can't see, we're not really gonna really effectively address these issues. Um, it's been very powerful doing this work and getting to know and make friends across the world that are doing this work. And um, also getting our youth and our children involved because really this is about them and those next seven generations of people that are going to have to take up this fight and to make sure that we have what we've been given as stewards um, to protect. Um, I think other than that, this is the second time I've been able to come to this summit. Um, I'm always appreciative of the work that goes on here and even um, the 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 reciprocal nature of it. Um, the Evergreen State College, the students here, Zoltan, they've been actively engaged in the work that we're doing out at Quinault and helped form those 
really awesome linkages with us and other groups. And so I really appreciate those resources that are given to us and um, also the opportunity to sit on panels such as this because it allows us to build that solidarity and make sure those coalitions remain strong. To give more background too, I was very moved by the um, presentation from the Lummi Nation youth earlier. And they talked a lot about canoe journeys. And I know that some of you in the audience are probably science students, but, um, and I know everyone's here for different reasons, but building those canoes, you know, and engineering them from our most ancient and beloved trees, you know, is a form of science. And that connection to the water and the air um, is also informed in our decision making when we uh, work on our natural resources issues. And so just to add more background to that, that resurgence of our culture and um, our livelihood is interconnected to that. Um, what the passion and the all the work that we're doing now is fueled by those values that set us apart and make us unique at Quinault, Lummi, or wherever you're from. And so um, seeing them be the product of that work and how it's all interconnected um, with our tribes here that are connected to the Salish Sea as well as on the Olympic Peninsula is a beautiful thing to me and um, deeply inspired and moved me. And so I just wanted to thank them for that. Seal Quill. That was really good. I think I'll just pass. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Wakeabo. My English name is Nancy Schippenthauer Games. And I'm from the Pialup tribe. <clears throat> my mother was from the Tulalip tribe. Her name was Janet McLeod. And um, so we grew up doing demonstrations for fishing rights. They both went to jail. And... Um, <clears throat> to fight for our treaty rights. And um, <clears throat> so I grew up in this, in this protest. Uh, we protested the nuclear submarines coming in. We protested at Bremerton. We protested what they were doing in, on the grounds of the, of the mouth of our river where they have all those chemical plants there. And <clears throat> at one time they used to have raw sewage coming down our river in the Puyallup tribe. And our people were fishing those, and they'd, you know, pull up toxic waste, you know. So when we did the land claim settlement, one of the main things was they were to clean the clean the water, clean the bay, you know, make it right again so that the salmon would come up. Well, if you look at history, once again, you know, they never abided by that land claim settlement, and our salmon is dwindling. This is the first time that Nisqually tribe has closed the river to chum fishery. The first, and they had the hugest chum fishery, and they closed it, because where's the salmon? We look in the water, you know, they're talking about putting this LNG plant up in, in our water, in our waterway. And they have a lot of a lot of things in the ocean that heats the water up. And this would be devastating for the citizens of Washington State if they're allowed to do this. The thing about it is this LNG plant is only for two ships, and they're from Alaska. That's all. It's, it's not for the public. It's not for people to use. It's only for two ships up in Alaska. And this plant is coming from... Uh, a foreign country, because they don't have no place to put it there, because they already ruined their land, so they're gonna come over here and ruin ours. You know, in the Navajos, in the 60s, the Navajos were fighting the uranium mines that were coming on their, their reservations. And there was this lady, her name was Roberta Black Goat, and she was an elder. And she would come to, my mother would have conferences like this, with different leaders from Six Nations, the Hopi, the Sioux, and you know, tribal leaders from here, all over the world they would come and she would do, talk about what, what was gonna happen in the next seven generations and what has happened in the past seven generations. You know, it's, it's like, um, we know what happened back there, but do we know what's gonna happen in the future? Now, how many of you have kids 
How many of you have grandkids? And I have great grandkids. I'm worried about what's going to happen to their future. I worry, you know, you go to a store and, and you buy bottled water. I remember going to the faucet, turning the water on and drinking the faucet. You know, you can't do And where's this water coming from? You know, who's, who's, who's pouring this water out of their faucet? You know, there's a lot of stuff we have to think about with our young people. And, and I don't think they're getting the right education in school on what's going on, what's happening, what do they have to look forward to. When I was, um, when I was younger, a lot younger, our mother used to have us typing things on. I don't know if you guys remember. Uh, we had a mimeograph. <laughs> And we, we learned how to type stuff up. You know, half the stuff we didn't know what was typing up. But then we'd all, she had eight kids. So they'd all stand in line and she would do a newsletter. And she would just send it out all over the place. And I tell you, it was hard work for all of us to stand there, put all these, pay, but she was informing people what's going on in, in the world. And at that time, you know, we could go to the rivers and go swimming. We can go to the springs and get water out of the springs. You can't do that today. The Puyallup River used to be clean, pristine water when I was growing up. And they had farmlands. That was prime farmlands there. Not anymore. Not anymore. I think the Squally River might be the only river in our area that's clean enough to go swimming in. And it comes from the, it comes from the mountain, Mount Rainier. And so we call it a spirit water. Muck Creek is a spirit creek that the Nisqually use. And that's that walk they're going on Saturday. That walk, they're going to take it in Muck Creek. And where all their people used to, used to camp. And they can't do it no more because Fort Lewis took it over. So I, I'm trying to think when I hear about these corporations you know, I think the corporations are just computers without any spirit, without any soul, without any emotion. That's what they are. They become, they're computers. These people are computers. They don't care what's going to happen in the future. You ever see those movies that they have on where all these people are dressed in black and there's nothing but concrete walls and, you know... And you wonder, is that what, our, what we're making for our, our children and our grandchildren? Is that, is that what's going to happen? This room should be packed with people, you know, so that they can send that message out. We're not going to do this. They could write to the Senate and Congress people and say, we're not going to do this. We need to stop all the fossil fuels because it's hurting our people. We're indigenous people, but we're all human beings. We all have that same tie to this land. We farm it. We eat the food here. We drink the bottled water, you know. But you guys are going to have to make a stand, all of you young people. And you're going to have to get up and start doing things. Just listening to us talk, take it out and share it with people. Think about the future. That's what you need to do. Every time I come and do these talks, I think about my great grandkids. I think about those young kids that are growing up in McDonald's, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken and things like that. They're not learning how to eat real food. And this food is poisoning them. It's poisoning their minds and their bodies. I know I'm just supposed to talk about, <clears throat> I'm here to talk about the LNG plant. But, you know, I kind of get off because I think that the future is important because these all affect everything. You know, what he talked about, what they're going to talk about affects your future. I knew this guy. He was a Hopi prophet. 
He talked about the Hopi prophecy. He's been here several times. Mary, Mary Ellen Hilaire and my mother used to have all kinds of uh, programs out here. And they used to go all over the place and talk about what was going to happen in the future. I didn't believe him. I was a young kid when I first met him, 13 years old. He talked about all this stuff. You know, the, the oil. He talked about the blast, black snake, too. He talked about that. He talked about the gas going up, things like that, the bread going up. Yeah, right, right. I didn't believe him. And then everything started happening. But what really caught my attention is when he said that the mothers, he said something about the mothers would cease to be mothers because they wanted to go to work. And they would have strangers raise their children. And he said, and there'll come a point where they'll, they'll kill their children. And so we was driving to this place, and there's this bridge on the Columbia River. It's called the Bridge of Gods, the Bridge of Gods. And I told my husband, let's go over that bridge. And he goes, this is the bridge where that woman threw all her children off into the Columbia River. And in the back of my mind, it clicked. Thomas told us they would do this. So when all these things started happening, it would click in my mind that this is going to happen. You know, he told, he told us this would happen. But what he said was that if the United Nations does not listen to the indigenous people of this world and put a stop to all of this, we will soon cease to exist. Our belief is that when the salmon quits running in our rivers, when we cannot harvest our salmon, then we will cease to exist. That's what our elders told us. So you need to listen and take this out to the world. You need to tell your children, tell your people. You know, how many of us use fossil fuel? Well, we all do. So how are we going to start tapering that off and use a different source of energy? like the sun, the wind, you know. Use those kind of energy instead of digging into Mother Earth and ripping her heart and her blood out. That's what I feel that they do. When they found <clears throat> that cave of crystals, I don't know if, if any of you seen those huge crystals in Mother Earth, and they have to wear a suit to go into this cave because the crystals are so huge, and the heat is this bad. So they have to wear these thermal suits to go in there. They, they can only stay, it, stay in there for so long. And I start thinking about that, and I was watching it on the internet, and watching it on the, reading about it in a book, and I said, I wonder if that's the heart of Mother Earth. Because the way the crystals are shaped in there, I wonder if that's the heart. And what do they plan on doing with the heart of Mother Earth? Well, that's my message today. And I'm, I'm thankful to be able to come out here and, and uh, come to my old school. I, Mary was a great teacher. And I was telling um, one of the students that that lady out there that they have holding her arms out, it was actually carved in memory of Mary Hilaire. And, and I don't know why they didn't put that on there, why they didn't put this as, this is in uh, memory of Mary, because she was a huge asset to this college. And she, she's the one who brought the Native American students in. So... Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Is this working? Is it working okay? Okay. Um, I'm Roxy. I'm uh, a resident of Tacoma. Um, 
my relatives were Nakota, um, Assiniboine. Uh, my grandfather and his mother grew up on the Fort Peck Reservation in Montana. And um, I think that, I think my grandmother is sort of speaking to me. Um, I think that's why I'm doing this work. I think she has a lot to do with it. Never met her. Um, don't really know much about her, but I think she's pushing me from wherever she is and um, showing me the way, I guess. Um, I'm here to talk about a bomb, essentially, that's being built in Tacoma on Puyallup land. And that is liquefied natural gas. It's fracked gas from the Bakken oil fields and on the other side of the Rockies. 42,000 tons of greenhouse gases a year, um, 80 tons of emissions going into your air, um, 170 tons of volatile organic compounds a year. And we drove out the methanol for now. Now they're building it down in Kalama on Cowlitz land. And I think that's when I really started to get into the activist movement and the environmental movement. But with this LNG, it's a little bit different. The company, I'm sure many of you have them for your gas company, Puget Sound Energy, criminals from Australia. Um, they're responsible for this and they are breaking the law. They're doing it in a way that is violating both treaty rights and also um, state, state law. And it's been like a sickness, like no one's really talking about it except a small group of people. Like people know about it, but they just kind of want to turn away from it. Natural gas has been greenwashed, I believe, since the 70s as a cleaner, greener fuel. And it's actually, that's not true. The carbon dioxide emissions are smaller than, say, oil and coal, but it releases more methane. And methane is essentially 85 times more potent and warming than carbon dioxide. And city officials, our governor, anybody that, you know, that works in the government, the city, anybody, they just don't want to believe the facts. And it's, um, it's been difficult. So that's why I'm here. And um, I don't really have that much to say. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm hoping that everyone in this room will, you know, do their diligence and um, research, research, spread the word, educate your kids and your relatives, um, your friends, everybody. There needs to be a much bigger resistance in Tacoma than there is right now. So I'm hoping you'll help me with that. There you go. Can everybody hear me all right? Yeah, pretty well. Here, hold on this. Being tall, you got to learn how to use these going up doing presentations. <laughs> Always got to do it a little bit up. Or even sometimes I just have to go like this. Because <laughs> I used to be a cook. I learned that little trick. <clears throat> so I'm here to talk about Kinder Morgan and the Kinder Morgan expansion which is uh, right up north from here, only 144, only 144 miles away from uh, 
Seattle. And then the tankers from, from the Vancouver Inlet will go through right through the Puget Sound and affect a lot of people here. So I'm here. Mm, we don't need this one. So I'm here to talk about Kinder Morgan. Uh, my name is uh, Cedar George Parker. I'll introduce myself in my native tongue. Uh, I'm Cedar George Parker from Tsleil-Waututh Nation and, um, and Tulalip tribes. And um, I guess I'm here to talk about the resistance that we have against Kinder Morgan and how we're standing up for our rights and our indigenous values, you know. Uh, that's, that's why I'm talking here, to, you know, save lives, I guess. <laughs> really, you know, yeah, it really is to save lives. So, who knows what, um, what the Alberta tar sands are? All right, that's cool. That's great. That's, that's really awesome. That's really good to hear that. So, that's where all this oil is coming from. It's going to go right into the Vancouver Inlet. And this picture right here is actually, I mean, this, this show right, slideshow right here that you can see this picture is actually right across from my res, right across from my reservation, the Tsleil-Waututh Nation. And it's, it's ridiculous that it's right across from us. Uh, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the things in our inlet have died. Um, our, we, can, we can no longer eat our clams. We can no longer eat the fish there. Uh, we, can't, we can't swim in the waters. We have to shower. Otherwise, you get itchy and you get rashes. Right across my res, you can see it. Just like you could see it at nighttime, you can see it at day. It's, it's a huge, huge power plant that they have there. And it's ridiculous the things that they are doing. But thanks to our rehabilitation programs, um, our salmon count went from 10,000 to 10 million. And just last year, we had our first clam dig in over 20 years. And that's because of our rehabilitation programs and us standing up against Kinder Morgan. And so that's the, this is where it is right here. That's what they want to expand into. Those ships are, are, are huge ships. You know, they're the biggest ones that will be coming through the Vancouver Inlet tall as the Seattle skyscrapers. And so this is the oil, this is where it comes from, the bitumen oil, the, the fracking oil. The, this, is, this is the worst, the dirtiest type of oil that you can get. That's what it looks like. And it takes two barrels, three and a half barrels of water, two tons of earth to get one barrel of oil. And it's crazy because 21,000 people die every day from dehydration. And that's, four se that's, that's one person dying every four seconds from dehydration and, and, and hunger when, when it takes three and a half barrels to get one barrel of oil. That's ridiculous. There's people dying. That's, that's crazy. And then so this is what it looks like in the Alberta tar sands. They're moving the size of France or Texas, which is the biggest industrial project that the world has ever seen today. And those are just little Tonka trucks. They're really little. You know what I mean? Like I, we could fit like just me could fit one of those, one of the wheels. <laughs> so no, they're not little. They're pretty big. Um, I could fit right in there. And, you know, it really does look like um, Mount Mordor, you know, from Lord of the Rings there. You, you go there, it really looks like that. It looks just like death, you know. It's ridiculous there, and the people who live there go through a lot of bad things. And so this is where the Alberta tar sands was um, in, in July 20, uh, 23rd, 1984. And that's, yeah, this, this all looks kind of like, like that, you know, a long time ago. And this is the oil tar sands, May 15, 2012. And the difference between here and there is the price of oil went up. So they found it conventional to do it, you know what I mean? Because you, you don't make as much money from getting oil this way. It takes a, it takes a lot of energy, you know? It's, it's really, really bad how they get the oil this way. It affects the people and they put it, in, and, and the water that they use to get the oil, they put it back in their own, uh, they, they put it back into the earth. They just leave it right there, you know? And, and here's how bad it is, the water that they use that, get, that gets mixed up with the oil. Um, they, they shoot a gun, automatic guns, uh, every two to five minutes so that the birds won't land in there. And when the birds land in there, they die. Uh, you know, my grandma went up there and saw a bear go in there, and the bear went a little bit further, and, and it just died. It's pretty sad. Really, really sad, you know. It's, it's really bad. And so in 2008, the Alberta, Alberta Health confirmed a 30% rise of cancer rates between 1995 to 2000 in Fort Chippewa, a community 200 kilometers downstream from Fort McMurray. And, and and we talked to local doctors around there. They said it's even higher than that. You know, that's just what the oil companies want us to see or whatnot. So that's real stuff right there. And, um, and Fort McMurray, where it comes around, has, has one of the highest concentrations of people with cancer. Uh, going up there is actually the reason why I do this activism. You know, I talked to this grandmother down there doing an interview. I was 17 at the time. I said, how was oil changed? How has the oil industry changed their community? And she said, well, when I was your age, I was able to hunt and fish and eat all the fish off the land. You know, I was able to do that. I was able to go swimming. I was able to go out and, and breathe, breathe happily. You know, I was able to breathe. And then, um, you know, from there, then she started talking about her daughter and saying how, um, you know, it's really sad because my daughter has cancer. You know, this has one of the highest con concentrations of cancer. My daughter has cancer. Then she started talking about her grandkids and how they have asthma at a young age and how she has to wash and bathe their children in bottled water. 
And then I started seeing her cry. And then once you see someone else's tears, it does something to you in the inside. So after that, I asked my humanity. I asked who I am as a person. I said, am I going to let this woman go through this? Am I going to let this happen? So I said, hell no. <laughs> we said, hell no. We, we said no, you know, to slave to nation and, uh, and many of the nations around the world, everyone's standing up and saying no because they see these effects. And so this is what it looks like when, um, so this is what the proposed pipeline is going to be. They're making it right now. And it goes through every major big population, like every major population in British Columbia. So it literally goes through schools and it goes under hospitals. So we have a lot of support from local school, high schools. You know, they just put on a big march in the downtown Vancouver. And, you know, it's really beautiful how these kids are doing this. So can, anyone, uh, can anybody point out what's missing here? Re the what? Yeah, that's missing too. That's true. Damn, I thought, no, no one knows. Wow. So this is the Fraser River watershed. It's, you know, it has a unique species, it has a unique species of salmon that travel over 1,000 kilometers. And so they call this like salmon mecca because the whole ecosystem is revolved around the salmon because the bears eat it and they poop and it gives nutrition to all the plants or whatnot. And that's how much, and that's exactly right where the, the pipeline is going to go through and affect all of those waters and all of those fisher, fisheries and fishermen who make money from that. It's not only going to affect, it's going to affect the economy too, you know, from all the fish stuff we get and so how likely is an oil is an oil spill if the pipeline is built so these are all the major pipelines in the united states from i'm pretty sure it says from 1990 to 2012 so yeah they say it's brand new and nothing's bad's gonna happen but every pipeline on here has yeah has a um, has an oil spill and do you know what's even crazy one ten out of those one tenth out of all those oil spills is just some idiot not knowing what he's doing just a mess up just just an error from the computer so they're saying we have these really expensive computers to they have all this technology but yes yeah, still one tenth of them are oil spills from just computers just someone being stupid and so did you know there's an 87 percent 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 chance of oil spill in the broadland that over 50 years as the proposed kinder morgan pipeline is built that is ridiculous. So what is Kinder Morgan's past, uh, uh, Morgan's past of record spills? So right here in this picture is actually Burnaby, which is a suburb of Vancouver. It's about 50 miles away from the border. And, and what really happened right here is a construction company was going through and doing construction. And Kinder Morgan didn't, didn't um, give the city any... Um, any overlook of where the oil goes underwater. So the construction just went right through it and, and you know, it burned. You know, they went right through the pipe, you know, the construction company, and it went all over the city. And, you know, Kinder Morgan didn't even pay for it. To the city, didn't even pay. Didn't even do anything. Didn't even say sorry. You know, it's, it's, it's crazy. And all these people had to go through these things. So these are some of the oil spills right here. Um, these, are the, these are the top 10 oil spills of the, of the Trans Mountain, which is right now, the one they have right now. So yeah, as you can see, there's a lot right here. And it even goes down through Washington, it affects all the people here. So it's, it's crazy, you know? So what impact would a spill have on our water? You know what's really crazy, though, is the, um, this. So did you know in case of an oil spill, Kinder Morgan has to provide you with bottled water? So this presentation is actually for the residents of British Columbia. So um, yeah, they, the, people of the, people, the residents of British Columbia are provided bottled water, but what happens when that spill gets to the Seattle area and the Puget Sound? You know, there's no promises to bottled water in the Puget Sound. There's 3.5 million people in the Seattle area not promised with bottled water. If, when an oil spill would happen, it would take 24 hours to, to affect the whole Puget Sound. Yet, yet Kinder Morgan and no oil companies have promised Washington State bottled water. So where are we going to bathe? Where are we going to get clean? Where are we going to drink our water when a, pilot, when a spill happens? Where are we going to go? You know, that, that makes me scared. Like, how are we going to get clean or even have water? That's ridiculous. It doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense. Just a little bit. No, I'm just playing. Um, how much would oil tanker, um, oil tanker traffic increase if the pipeline was built? Uh, did you know... The proposed Kinder Morgan project could increase the number of tankers moving through the Burrard Inlet from 30 to over 400, and all of those go through the Puget Sound. It's ridiculous. Doesn't make sense. So yeah, that's 30 to over 400 tankers coming in and out, all going to China and around the world, not even for the Canadian citizens or United States citizens. So how would the proposed pipeline imp impact orcas? Well, it'd impact orcas, like, even if they had no oil in it or whatnot, even the noise traffic can kill 
the noise traffic will kill the orca whales and kill all the orca whales around here and all the, all the salmon and all the fish, you know. And it would affect our communities and economy because a lot of people come to Washington and Vancouver to see, the, you know, to see the atmosphere, to see how it is. So it would affect our economy and how the, the living of how the people live in, the, in these areas in the Puget Sound. So this is what it looks like right now, where the, where the pipeline goes through right now. This is not it expanded. And as you can see, it goes right through here. So it's not even a Canadian issue. It, it, it's an everybody issue. It'll affect everybody who, who shares those waters, you know? And then that's why I'm fighting, is because of the memories that I have for this water, you know? Uh, my brothers and sisters, like, we all live here, and I love them so much, and that's why I'm fighting for this, because no one can ever take away those memories. No one can ever take away the memories that I have with my friends and my family living in this area. All that I know is in this area. All the people that I love in this area. And that's going to affect everyone here. It's crazy. It's nuts. So as you can see, it comes right in through here. going to affect 3.5 million people in the Seattle area, not including Olympia, Bellingham, Mount Vernon. It's going to affect the 2.5 million people living in the Vancouver area. That's everybody that we love. That's all our schools. And not everybody but I love, but that's the people that we love and share memories with. You know, that's, that's ridiculous. So how would an oil spill affect fish, birds, and other wildlife? So this, is the, um, so this is the area where the salmon come through in the Vancouver area. Uh, when an oil spill were to happen, it would kill all, all of them right in here, all of the fish in here. And these are all the main like, um, swimways that fish go through. It would kill all the fish and it would practically kill our economy. Because that's what, you know, we're really dependent off the economy with fish, you know, or whatnot, and, and traveling. And then so just in this area, in the purple, when an oil spill were to happen, it would, it would kill 500,000 birds and they'll never come back. That's not including the Puget Sound. That's not including the Georgia Strait. That's just ridiculous, you know what I mean? Like, like, like it takes me where the, the little star is right there, it takes me about 15 minutes to get to the other side right here, the island right there. It takes me 15 minutes, so this area is very small. This is like the Vancouver, this is like the Vancouver city, North Van and, and Vancouver. So how much will oil tie sands add to global warming? A lot. <laughs> So oil, oil sands bitumen, bitumen is called dirty because, it produces, because its production emits 3.2 to 4.5 times more greenhouse gases than conventional crude oil. Even taking its full cycle into account, including extracting, upgrading, refining, trans, transporting, and combusting oil, oil sands bitumen increases 22% more climate damage, damage than conventional oils because it takes a lot of energy. Like I said, it takes three and a half barrels of water two tons of earth, two tons of dirt to get one barrel of water. And even in that way, in that process, it's dirty. In that process, it's bad for the environment. Just the process. Yeah, and that comes out with two million barrels a day. And uh, actually, they're trying to up that up now. Climate leaders don't build pipelines. That's 100% true. You know, Trudeau said that to go forward in, in this green economy that we have to... Um, that we have to invest into oil so that we can raise money for renewable energy. <laughs> yeah, he said that. And actually, my dad right now and I were standing right where these two were fighting it. So it's pretty funny seeing this, you know. It's, now I'm up here, you know. And one thing about politicians I want to let you know is that my favorite pizza is cheese. No, no I'm playing. It's not cheese. It's pepperoni. No, 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 no. It's not pepperoni. It's margarita. I just lied to you three times. That's how easy it is coming to a pedestal and lying to you guys without you guys doing your homework. You know what I mean? I lied to you three times. It's going to take a while for you to know what my favorite pizza is. That's how easy it is to lie. That's how easy it is for a politician to come up to a pedestal and lie and just say funny words. And That's crazy. <clears throat> So they, uh, he's a liar. <laughs> and, and, you know, there's a, the one thing that I've noticed is that there's a lot of energy into saying no to, um, say, you know, I feel, like, I feel like being environmentalist is a big no factor. You know what I mean? Like, oh, it's just no to this, no to jobs. But no, that's not true. You know, like this is, this is how much um, the, the silicon PV cells in USS Per watt, so this is a um, this is a what do you call it? a solar energy? How much how much the cost has come down? So as you can see, in 1977 it was 76 dollars, and in 2015 it's 30 cents. And that, that's that's just proof right there that that green energy is the way of the future. And to really, really, really that I feel like to put energy into green energy, you know. And as the no, as like like I said, as being the no factor, I am the yes factor to, to green energy. We are the yes factor to green energy. We are the yes factor to standing up for our future to go through with love and compassion as indigenous people that's what we're doing and um yeah that, that's it right there 
Oh, okay, you can't really see this, but this is the truth about job creation. I don't, I don't know what happened. Uh, usually it's nice. <laughs> I'm not on it. <laughs> but so this is the job. So right here it says per million dollars invested into jobs. And the, and the first one at the very top is oil. So you get, you get five jobs for investing a um, million dollars. And then the second one is... Coal, you get seven jobs. And then the one where you can see is 14, that's solar energy jobs. So as you can see right there, it's almost triple <laughs> than, than, than the, both those jobs, you know? And then for number, when you see 18, that's wind turbine. So you can see the jobs created from a million dollars invested for people having jobs. And for the oil, okay, let's make this, let's make this, let's make sure that you guys know this. For the oil jobs, those are not permanent. A lot of the jobs there are, are, are not permanent. That's just making the pipelines. And then and where do all those jobs go, you know? That's crazy. So yeah, as you can see, like, like renewable energy is the way of the future. And you know, like I said, I'll say it again because you can't really see it. It's 14 jobs for um, solar energy and it's 18 jobs for um, wind turbine. When it comes to uh, oil, oil extraction, that's five jobs and coal, which is seven jobs. So that's the truth. That's really what's going on in the world economy. And, and as of 2014, there's more renewable jobs than oil extraction jobs in the United States. So we are going the right way, you know. We really are going the right way. There's always hope. And this is um, to, to invite all of you guys up to Canada, to Vancouver. This is like right in the inlet. These people, like we're having a big event, a water ceremony with Pacific Islanders from Fiji because all of their, their, all of their um, traditional territory went underwater. So they're coming over with us in solidarity to, you know, stand up for life, to stand up for who we are as people and that we could, you know, save our future or whatnot. So this is what's going down up there. It's, a, it's in Kate's Park. I'll have some information on you at the end. And... Um, yeah, it's gonna be beautiful. We're gonna we're gonna go out on the water and go right to where the uh, terminals are of Kinder Morgan. It's, it's gonna be beautiful, you know. I, I really invite all of you guys to come up for the celebration of life and the celebration of standing up, the celebration of solidarity. And then uh, one thing that I always think that we should do is, uh, you know, we always have to stay connected. As you can see, we have Facebook, we have the internet, we, we have Twitter, Instagram, you know, we have all these things that are screaming out human encounter encounterment. We're having these things that are screaming out human, you know what I mean, humanity, you know, the scream for humanity to all come together. So I really encourage you guys to take a picture of this. Add me on Facebook or whatnot. You know, I, I love to work with anybody and whoever as long as we go forward through love and compassion. You know, I'd really love to work with all of you guys. You know, I really believe in one person at a time. You know, one person at a time really will change the world. I feel as if, you know, that, that human encounter, man, when we just talk, you know, just talk to the people that you know. Because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really doing this for my little brother. You know, I'm doing this for my goddaughter. You know, I'm, I'm really doing it for when I look down at them on our land. You know, I don't, I don't want them to have to shower after they go into the water. I don't want them to have to get bottled water to shower themselves, to, to drink only bottled water. No, I want them to come out into the faucet. Like one of the, like, like people were saying, I want them to go to the faucet. I want them to go into the water. I want them to fish. I want them to see the beautiful Northwest. You know, it's, it's so beautiful here. And that's why people come here around the world. You know, it's going to really affect our economies from fishing to our communities to travel. It's going to affect our economies when the oil spill happens. And remember, there's an 87% chance of oil spill. So like I said, let's really, really stay connected. Let's stand together, you know. Um, some people said that, oh, Native, Native Americans will, will never all join together, you know, or, or they said oil will always be the future. But no, you know, like, like one thing that, saw, that we saw from Standing Rock, it said a president of, uni of people uniting, coming together to stand up with each other, you know. Well, let's stand together and fight for our future. Let's come together, put our differences aside. Because what I saw in Standing Rock was Muslims eating with Christians, Buddhists eating with Native to come together, you know. But they're coming together with love. So, you know, let's use that love. Let's come together. Let's fight. Let's fight for our future. This is going to be our future. We're all, we're all call, you know, a lot of us are younger in here. You know, we really have to fight because the reality is the younger you are, the more terrified you should be of our future. The older you are, the less terrified you should be. So let's get terrified. Let's use that fear as our strength. You know, let's use that hurt and pain as a strength and stay connected. Um, my favorite pizza, by the way. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> but thank you, though. <laughs> thank you, Cedar. And thanks to all of the panelists.
want to point out a, a couple of things in the program. One is the map on page three that shows the location of the Kinder Morgan uh, pipeline, the proposed expansion, um, uh, including down into Washington, the uh, Grays Harbor oil terminal at Hoquiam and Aberdeen. We're, we're in the right place to do something about these. We're at the right time in history. So this is the time to get involved. And one way to uh, you know, hook up with different groups, on the website, on the last page, on the very bottom, sites.evergreen.edu slash indigenous climate, the website of our project, there's all sorts of links to all these organizations. You can either find out information or start to get involved. And uh, there's also information here if you're a native or indigenous youth uh, or know of any. Um, this Sunday at the Nisqually, uh, reservation starting at 11 a.m. There's going to be an Indigenous Youth Day for climate justice, a way to get involved. Um, there's going to be a couple of meals and there's going to be a coastal jam at the end. So it's both making that human connection and finding out about these issues and how to get involved in them. So we're going to have, uh, we have some time for questions and we've got a student going around uh, who's going to be going around with a microphone. So um, uh, we've got some time for questions. Okay, over here, Ava. Oh, right here. Thank you all very much for coming and making your wonderful presentations. Can you hear me? Yeah. One of the things that strikes me hearing each of you speak is we are in an extremely seismically active area with volcanoes and earthquake faults. So it seems to me that there's a hundred percent certainty that we're going to have massive spills, not just from a single tanker or a small pipeline. If you look over a period of time, it's guaranteed to be horrific. And I would think there would be some way that in each of your efforts, we could hook up with the emergency preparedness organizations and stuff because there might be some greater assistance they could add to that because that's guaranteed to happen here in the Pacific Northwest yeah. and, and, and the catastrophic damages would be un, unimaginable. So I just wanted to throw that out and see if there's ways each of you could link up with the emergency preparedness people. I'm not sure they're a lot of help because they're government, but... Uh, it just occurred to me because it's guaranteed to happen and I can't imagine the insanity of trying to put these facilities in with that factor in mind. So that's the big thing. I mean, no one is paying attention and people in Tacoma, um, other activists, I haven't done it yet, but they have contacted everybody, including fire and emergency. It's like they're, they're blind. They don't yeah. care. The, yeah. they're, they're telling us that they can't help us until something happens after we're dead, after we're you know, in oil and we have to wear gas masks. They're not going to do anything. It's, this is why there needs to be you know, massive resistance because in common sense, in, in our brains, in everyone's brains in this room, duh, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> the LNG is going to be going right in the Lahar zone. And it, it's like we're, we're each in like kind of an in, insane asylum, and we're the only ones that are sane, and they're just not getting it. If that LNG plant was to explode, there would be no emergency responders because they'll all be gone. Right. That that's a, that um, LNG plant is four atomic bombs in one. So the Puyallup tribe is actually in court with them right now. And all the other um, areas approved it and they were keeping this quiet from the Puyallup tribe, and all of a sudden we got wind of it. And right away, they, they went and filed in federal court to stop this. 
And so they haven't been able to make any progress right now. But we hear they're still building like a platform. So then our attorneys are once again going to court to stop that platform. So, but I'm, I'm just saying that if, um, like, but listen, think about when Mount St. Helens went out, you know, went up. And, and they gave that warning, it's, it's going, it's going, it's going. How many people went up there to watch it go off? How many people went up there to be involved in it? And they're all gone now, see? But, um, but yeah, if that, if that goes off, then, then, then we'll be gone. I mean, we'll just vaporize. Could you explain the ex status of the LNG? Is it under construction? Is it being fought in court? What, what's actually happening on the ground right now? Well, once the tribe filed in court, they had to stop. And, and so that's, that's all I can talk about because our tribe's not even talking about it right now because it is in court. And, but they filed paperwork and when they did that, then they had to stop doing things. But it was already under construction. Oh yeah, yeah, they had all everybody else approve it, and um, then Pialup came in and said, "No, you're not, you're not doing that. You're not doing that here," and they put a stop to it. I could probably give another answer as well. I'm not Pialup tribe, so I can talk about it. Um, they're not stopping, unfortunately. I don't know. Um, what all they're allowed to do, but they have cleared the site and they are drilling down there. They're preparing the site, they're doing testing, um, and they're doing the, they're looking for contract, they're doing the union contracts this month um, for the building construction. So I'm pretty sure they can't really do anything in, until like, you know, court is done, but um, which is amazing that the Puyallup tribe is fighting this because without them, I, it, it, would, it would probably already have been built. So um, they, they're, they're breaking the law and they are breaking a court order. They are continuing work. They're still messing with the earth down there, um, but I don't know what all they can do with the court cases. I had a question. Um, and you've both spoken to it related to the uh, courts in regard to the liquid natural gas in Tacoma. But in particular with the Kinder Morgan, I wondered if you could explain, especially for an American audience, where do things stand with the Canadian courts, the whole issue about challenging Kinder Morgan in the courts. Can you explain a little bit for us about that? Yeah, yeah, I can. Um, all right, so British Columbia, which is a province where it's going through, is um, weird. it's unceded territory. There's no treaties. And one thing that Canadian government is supposed to do is, is con con consult with... Um, with First Nations, and which which they didn't, and they just go, they just uh, practically just said f you and put that thing right in through the put the pipeline right through. So right now we're suing Canada. Uh, actually, if you took a picture of my last thing of, of my last um, slideshow, it would show it, it showed a website where you could donate money to our lawyers to to to, to stand up against Kinder Morgan. So yeah, well, um, we're gonna win. They already proposed the pipeline a couple years back. We went up there, set up camp, and we won. We stopped it and. One thing that we're going to do is do it again because of um, our, our, our indigenous rights protect us in British Columbia. So, yeah, it, it changes all the time because there's no treaty, right? So there's no treaty. Like, there, you have, literally have to kind of make laws and then go through the whole system in, in some... Hello? Oh. <laughs> in some, like some type of way. And it's really, really, really confusing. Like, the best way to explain it is that Practically, we're going to sue Canada. We're suing Canada for not consulting with First Nations. So we're going to court. We're raising the money. Um, that's, that's what this slide, slideshow is supposed to be for. <laughs> so, yeah, if you saw at the end, just go to polltogether.ca, and uh, you could donate money to us, to, to, to the lawyers, to, to fight against Kinder Morgan. So, yeah, there's a, there's a big fight. Um, we're going to beat it, though, definitely. We already beat the pipeline that uh, tried to win, go through last time. 
a couple years back, and yeah, we beat it. <laughs> uh, hi. Um, I had a question about the status of the LNG plant, and that was answered. And my second question is, are there upcoming actions, and what is the best way for everybody here to make sure that we're contacted so we can all show up and disrupt that, and what is going on as far as that? Nancy, you want to say something about that? Or? Just tell me on Facebook. I mean, I have something to say, but okay. <laughs> um, so uh, there, <laughs> there are, how do I say this without sounding... Off. Um, there are a few environmentalist groups in Tacoma that <laughs> they're very exclusionary and um, this is going to sound rough, but um, me looking from the outside, I've noticed that they are sort of using Puyallup tribal members as token Indians. Um, if you guys don't know what that means, I encourage you to take Sweetwater Nanox class de de decolonizing our activism, it's really good. Um, but it's, it's been very exclusive with these groups. Um, I actually started a group called uh, Climate First Responders, um, the name inspired by Robert Satyakam. And uh, we're basically a group of um, indigenous people um, who are focused on indigenous rights and environmental rights. So um, that's where you can find me. I have flyers as well um, with my email, and but it, on Facebook it's Climate First Responders. And we have time for one more question. Oh, and, and for the and you could look up uh, 350.org, our Sierra Club, or there's lots of organizations around, uh, like really big organizations that you could look up, or even on Facebook. Like, uh, yeah, definitely go on Facebook. Uh, look, look for 350.org Seattle, or uh, Sierra Club Seattle. Like, I, I know a lot of people like working working with the, the, these two organizations that could help you with that, and definitely just like look up online, so you can get more involved. There, there's definitely always Facebook pages for. Um, for, for any environmental action around the world, just look it up on Facebook. Just do some, do some internet, you know. <laughs> and, and on the project's website at the end of the program, uh, there's actually a link to Climate First Responders and Slowwood Tooth and all the others. So we have time for one more question. Yeah, thanks. Um, hi, my name's Brian Manning. I, I'm an organizer with Greenpeace USA. I've had the privilege and honor to work on the green team with the canoe journey and also uh, help support what Blummy on the totem journey. Um, in working to resist uh, coal exports the past four years, what I would say is a lot of the success on that campaign was due to indigenous-led strategies and um, tactics, which is what we saw from Lummi and what we saw at the Columbia River tribes. Um, my question is for you, George. Um, based in Portland, what can we do to um, support uh, the Kinder Morgan fight? From Portland? Well, there's many things that you could do. One thing that I would say is add Sacred Trust on Facebook. Um, add Sacred Trust. Uh, go to Sacred Trust online, and there's lots of different things that you could do. Is donate money. We could always donate money. And actually, if you go to the Pull Together campaign, um, we're getting. We're, we have we we have a setup where anybody like anybody could uh, could raise money for Pull Together for our lawyers to stand up against Kinder Morgan because um, one thing is for sure is that you know the, we're spending all this money on, on in the courts while while some of our people are, are still starving you know or we you know we could be giving that money to to to, to sorry to 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 <laughs> to housing or or for clothing on our people's back but you know we we know that our land is more important and so we're fighting that way um, another things that you could do is get in contact with me uh, get get in contact with Paul together and I could tell you how to even do um fundraisers your own fundraiser fundraisers. One cool fundraiser that we liked to, that we did up in, um, well, well, that somebody else did. Our, our nation didn't. That somebody else did for us was um, they went around with um, different breweries around town to donate keggers, and so we said, donate keggers, not tankers. And the funny part, and no, the funny part about that is that there's more jobs in the beer industry than the than the oil industry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's many things that you could do, but I would say really just um, add me on Facebook, uh, Cedar George Parker. Add 
add Sacred Trust on Facebook. Go to Sacred Trust, the website, or pull together the website. And, and anywhere around the world, you could donate money and even put up your own um, fundraisers. You know, we help with that. We could definitely help with that, like do, do the fundraisers. And the biggest thing of all is just to go down there and talk with people, you know. Uh, what you learned here, just spread it. You know, one thing, I, one thing that we really do believe in in my res is the raindrop, you know, the, the ripple effect. You know, one person going somewhere and be that ripple effect. So I just really say be that ripple effect, you know. We could all be that ripple. We could all be a raindrop of water around the world or whatnot. And, you know, there's, there's many other things that you could do. Like, like just stay connected practically. You know, we have Facebook, like I said. These things are screaming out that humans stay connected. So... Those are some of the main things that you could do right now from Portland or from wherever you are around the world. Just like even putting on little events, we help with that. We, you know, um, anything that you could do. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to think right now, right off the bat. Practically, yeah, just talking, uh, just sharing, posting and sharing. That's one thing that we really try to do is uh, when one person posts something, that we get 10 other people to post it. And that's, you know, some people have 1,000, you know, they have 5,000 friends to a couple hundred friends to zero, 10 friends. But that's still 10 people seeing it. That's 5,000 people seeing it or whatnot. So really just add, add each other on Facebook and just share, you know. Um, even, even if you put on like little for Facebook, you could use a lot of things for Facebook, like Facebook Live, these events or whatnot, because Facebook has a system that puts, they're trying to make Facebook Live really big right now. So, so they really push in Facebook Live. So when you post it on, on Facebook, it, it'll, it'll, it, they'll, it calls up it, they'll, like they'll up the views. They'll, they want people to see it. So it's always on the top uh, of the news page. And then there's a, also, also we have, you could also make a lot of group chats on Facebook, make group chats just to get people to talking about it. That's one thing that we're doing as campaigners, just getting like people to talk about it, you know, mothers, daughters, uh, fathers, sons, you know, family members, uh, artists or whatnot, just to, just to come together in life and talk about how, how Kinder Morgan's going to affect their life and their lifestyle. There's definitely, there's a... Um, Lots of things that you could do just, just you know, always, always hits me like that. It's just, you know, really to obtain information and, and spread that information out. Because the fact is if everybody around the world knew, knew about what we, you know, um, what we knew in here, I guess, like, I think it would definitely be a different place, you know. If everybody, you know, had the knowledge of what oil does or whatnot and, and, and how good renewable energy is, the world would definitely look better. So i just practically saying spark a fire, you know, spark a fire. You know, put that fire, you know, you put one piece of wood right there, that's a little fire, you know, you, if everybody brings in their own piece of wood here, we would, we would have a big fire, and then these oil companies could see that fire from far away, you know, you have one piece of wood, you can't see it from far away, right? <laughs> you know, we want a big fire, they, we want to show them our fire, right? We want to show them that, what we got, so practically doing anything, you know, using social media to your, to your, to your advance, you know, you, using social media is a really, really, really big thing, because everybody can see it, it's like, you know, like I said with the Facebook, um, Facebook groups, uh, our, our chats, you know, Facebook's making a lot of these things, or even Twitter, uh, Instagram, Snapchat. Um, actually, yeah, Snapchat, like for example, some, um, when I, whenever I go to events, we make a Snapchat filter, so there might be a Snapchat filter for here right now. I didn't talk to my communications team, but yeah, there's, I don't know, there might be. <laughs> so, so yeah, um, there's so many things that you could do, but the main thing I would say, just talk, just talk, you know. Thanks. Well, thanks uh, so much to our panelists. They'll be available up here for questions during our um, break. And I uh, uh, wanted to welcome one of the students, Ryan, from our Catastrophe Community Resilience in the Face of Disaster program, kind of referring to the question earlier. And I uh, wanted to thank all the students from the Catastrophe program. If you could just uh, stand up for a sec. Wanted to acknowledge all your work today to help out. Here's Ryan for our protocol. Uh, hello. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you to our panelists. Just wanted to say thank you to our panelists and everybody who was uh, here today. I have some uh, gifts from Alma Barton from the Macaw Nation. Uh, I learned a lot about the pipelines and the projects here in the Northwest. I did not know about the ones here in the Northwest. So uh, I guess I'll just present them. Okay, well, thank you, Ryan.
So um, we're going to take a 15-minute break and come back for the panel and discussion on the reverberations of Standing Rock with the one and only Faith Spotted Eagle uh, and Marles Blackbird and Lydia Drescher. So uh, please come back in 15 minutes. All right, we're going to get started. So come on in. I'd like to thank everyone who is staying for our panel. Our next panel, I'm very excited about this one. Um, this is a beautiful day outside, so I'm glad that you're in here. Hopefully we won't have any thunderstorms. Our program um, uh, has had some experiences with loss of electricity at Evergreen in the past quarter, couple of quarters, so we're just knock wood that we don't get any thunderstorms on anything. I, I shouldn't have said anything, right? I've probably um, jinxed us somehow. Uh, but good afternoon. My name is Christina Ackley, and I'm a citizen of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin, as well as a Bad River Chippewa descent, and I teach here in Native American studies. Um, and I've been here since 2000. Uh, and I'm very, ex my great honor and privilege to introduce our next panel, uh, which is Reverberations from Standing Rock, of Standing Rock. Um, and I think st Standing Rock is so important for a number of reasons. One, it certainly created uh, um, a frame or uh, a narrative by which many people were able to, which resonated with many people. In some ways, it really just made visible work that has been ongoing, that has been um, um, generation after generation, and it highlighted that and brought that to the fore. So in some ways, it was just sort of you know, making visible to the broader world, to the international arena, things that were already happening. And it was also generative. Um, there were many uh, um, alliances and, and uh, um, partnerships that were created. So my um, baby cousin, although she's not so much a baby anymore, she's uh, going to graduate from high school this year. Uh, this winter, she traveled to Standing Rock with her youth group. Um, and it was really powerful to see her as a young person really come into her own and see herself as an agent of change. Um, it was really heartwarming to see that happen. And my other um, cousin, who's my age and not so young, uh, but you know, not, not older either, um, he is on a road of recovery um, and uh, has, has particularly been looking at Haudenosaunee avenues of recovery and um, particularly working through La Crosse um, and also traveled to Standing Rock and that was really another important step on his way of um, asserting autonomy over his own story and also seeing how he can be a part of um, a really healing um, uh, narrative. And so I think many Native and non-Native people have those stories from Standing Rock, so I'm really excited for um, our next panel. And so what we'll do is I'll introduce our panel. Um, they will then um, talk, and then we'll have time for, I hope, a robust discussion. Our first presenter is Marles, Marlis Blackbird, she's Hong Papa Lakota, um, and she's an Olympia LMT uh, and water protector supporting human and indigenous rights. At the age of 19, she moved to her father's birthplace on the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation. Her education was at Black Hills State College, Standing Rock Community College, Pierce College, the Evergreen State College, where she became active in the American Indian Movement, and the Seattle Massage School. She has an Associated of Arts degree in early childhood education and has worked as a teacher's aide at McLaughlin Elementary School in Cannonball, North Dakota, and Wahilut Indian School in Franks Landing, Washington. She also worked in the background in films such as Thunderheart and Dances with Wolves. So please welcome Marlis. Our second speaker will be Lydia Drescher. She's a California native, Tongva, from the Los Angeles Basin with indigenous familial, root, familial roots in California, Texas, and northern Mexico. Lydia resides in western Washington with her family, where she is a mother, wife, entrepreneur, and a graduate of Evergreen, a 2014 alum. She is an advocate of language and cultural revitalization, food sovereignty, and community building. And her current project, which I'm sure she'll be talking about, and I'm very excited to hear about, um, is an indigenous community space and healing garden modeled after the collective work at Standing Rock. And our final speaker um, will also be giving our keynote tonight, this Faith Spotted Eagle, uh, is a member of the 
Ahangtuan, um, Dakota Nakota on the Yankton Sioux Reservation of South Dakota. She's played a leading role in the alliances opposing the Keystone and Dakota Access Pipelines. She attended American University and Black Hills State College and holds a Master's in Educational Psychology and Counseling from the University of South Dakota. She has been a private consultant in PTSD counseling for veterans, as well as a school counselor and principal, and a Dakota language teacher at Sintagleska College. She's a founding member of the Braveheart Society, an organization for teaching girls about traditional culture, chair of the Ehunktawan Treaty Committee, and the manager of Braveheart Lodge in Lake Andes, which seeks to preserve Dakota cultural beliefs for the future. She has served as a delegate of the Treaty Committee NGO at the United Nations, and in 2016 election, she became the first Native woman to receive an electoral vote for president. So um, I'd like to welcome our full panel, um, as, and um, uh, we'll start off um, with Marlis. But also, I guess I should also um, definitely, uh, let's give a round of applause for Faith. <laughs> All right, and we'll start with Marlis. My name is Marles Blackbird, and through my father, my tribal affiliation is Hunkpapa from Standing Rock and Mini Koju from Cheyenne River. And on my mother's family, they come from Poland. My, far, my heart feels good and honored to be here with everyone this afternoon at the Longhouse in the lands of the Medicine Creek Treaty Tribes. And I'd like to t thank Zoltan for giving me the opportunity to be with Lydia and Faith. And I'm really not quite sure how I ended up being a speaker up here, but I'm very grateful for that role. Um, and I'm very grateful to be here with one of my role models, Faith Spotted Eagle. And I'm always um, very happy to be here with Lydia. And I'm quite, um, even though I'm quite overwhelmed to be here, um, I really love being here in the Longhouse. It's very comforting and peaceful to me. It's a very powerful place where many ancestors have blessed us during our gatherings over the years. Many words of truth have been spoken here, and sometimes these truths have not been easy to accept. Yet we continue to journey through these truths. This time of gathering to me is truth to power the power we have to bring about change using our people power to support climate justice. Everything we do is connected to the water. Our relationship is sacred. Mani Wichoni, water is life. The blood of our ancestors runs through our veins, so it's innate for us to defend and protect Makochi Ina, Earth Mother, and we have a responsibility to continue to nurture the communities we have created at the camps at Standing Rock, where over 500 tribes were represented from across Turtle Island and the world to defend the land, honor the treaties, and protect our sacred waterways, Manishoche, the Missouri River. All the camps at Standing Rock are, are spiritual, indigenous-led, an indigenous-led struggle on indigenous land, rooted in many, many, many years of resistance, and cultural strength. And this isn't the first time that there's been a gathering at Standing Rock. When I lived at Bear Soldier on the South Dakota side of the Res, uh, Standing Rock hosted in June of 1974 the first International Treaty Council Conference at Wakpala on the Missouri River. Indigenous people from North, Central, and South America, the Arctic, Pacific, and, and Caribbean came. And because of this uh, first treaty council in 74, we have status at the United Nations Economic and Social Councils today. So whether it be from North Dakota to the Sable Trail Pipeline in Florida, to Cherry Point at Lummi, the Puyallup in Kalama with the uh, LNG, the liquid natural gas, to fracking province in Olympia, to the Great Lakes Restoration Project, which is in jeopardy now due to the EPA funding, we are planting seeds of resistance on a more global level than ever before, building cultures of resistance to stop extractions of our resources and decimation of our earth. We've rekindled and reawakened our spirits 
and we have taken the movement to our villages and our homes. We are all in this together. And one of the movements uh, that came out of Standing Rock is the divestment movement to fight against DAPL and Dakota Access Pipeline, to get the banks to stop providing loans and other financial support to these pipelines and fracking. This direct action of divestment is happening all around the world against big corporations that rape our lands and poison our waters. And Matt Remley, who is Papa and is not unable to be with us here today, he lives in Seattle, he played a major role, along with many others, in getting the city of Seattle, the council, to divest from Wells Fargo Bank. And here in Olympia, we're working on the city council to divest from U.S. Bank, and we are now approaching Chase Bank to not provide any loans or support to the KXL and the Dakota Access Pipeline. We have a lot of work to do in this area of divestment. We're all in the struggle together. We stand up, rise up, and do what is right. And now I would like to read a, poet, a piece of poetry from Floris Whitebull, who is Lakota. She's the co-writer and advisor to the movie Awake, A Dream from Standing Rock. And some of you may have already seen this. I haven't yet had the opportunity to see it. I've been woken. I've been woken by the spirit inside that demanded I open my eyes and see the world around me and seeing that my children's future was in peril, see that my life couldn't wait and slumber anymore, see that I was honored to be among those who are awake. To be alive at this point in time is to see the rising of Ocheti Shakui, to see the gathering of nations and beyond that, the gathering of all races and all faiths. Will you wake up and dream with us Will you join our dream? Will you join us? And again, that was Floris Whitebull. Wopila Mini Wichoni. Nonetongba, Koyapachi, Koy Robert Murray. Kiyane Ashuvne, Olympia, Washington, Ha. Is it? None Hunuk Fatam, Nahinkam, Yarokomo Kreme, Iyo Hinkmo, Hunuk Vetmo, Tehovagaha. My name is Lydia Kitakut Drescher. I am Tongva Fernandeno from the Los Angeles Basin in California with indigenous roots in Texas and northern Mexico. I currently live in Olympia, Washington. My father's family comes from Pashinkna, the ancestral village site where the San Fernando Mission sits today, from the valley where the mountains face the sea. I am my ancestors. I am the determination, the resilience, the product of their histories, which I reclaim and I honor. As indigenous people of the Los Angeles Basin, we lived in self-sustaining villages where we had access to hunting, to fishing, and we traveled the Pacific waters in our canoes, which we called tiots. We thrived and we lived amongst our Chumash neighbors. During Spanish colonization, we were swept up into the mission system as forced labor to build and maintain the missions. Children were removed from their families. Our language was prohibited, as was our religion, our ceremonies, and our songs. After the mission system came to an end, we were disconnected from our way of life. We were disconnected from nature. By 1818, 86% of our population perished in the mission system, and the remaining were scattered throughout the lands, through the four winds, in many directions. The violence and genocide that continued into the late 1800s in California included legal bounties on our heads, 
ranging from 25 cents per scalp to $5 per severed head. And this was the law. Women and children were sold into slavery, and this led many of them to flee into the mountains to hide or to silently assimilate into Hispanic culture, waiting for the time in which we can reveal ourselves and our true heritage. The landscape of my ancestors is much different today, of course. The LA Basin and the coastal waters are prime real estate with multi-million dollars homes, asphalt, concrete, high rises, and constant dislocation of its original inhabitants due to land grabs, rising housing costs, and the exploitation of resources. But on a positive note, within my lifetime, I have seen the revitalization of our Tongva language by working with linguists and the Smithsonian Institute in the Library of Congress. We have added more words to our dictionary. Thank you. Sorry about that. We have unearthed ancient songs, and after 200 years, our second canoe has been built, which we call a tiat, and has participated in our local canoe journeys here in Washington. We are hopeful for the future as there is a cultural resurgence and pride among our youth throughout Indian country to honor and return to our traditional ways. The action at Standing Rock to end DAPL and its potential to poison a vast source of drinking water to thousands of people encompassed many issues affecting Indian country today. Broken treaties, ecological devastation, racial injustice, the overreach of government, and the militarized police who protect private corporate interest over the rights of Native people. And the silencing of our people in the decision-making process on issues that impact, impact our lives, this has gone on for far too long. Standing Rock is one action among many that are taking place nationally as well as globally. First people everywhere have been rising up in defense of the precious gift the Creator has bestowed upon us, the gift to live, to thrive, and to sustain ourselves. But to our planet's detriment, we face an opposition by the corporate world that seeks profit and exploitation for the benefit of only a few at the expense of many. The constant exploitation of our planet is unsustainable as we see our water poisoned, ecological disasters, earthquakes through fracking, and our sea life, four-legged and feathered relatives becoming extinct. So, when the call came to stand in solidarity with my Lakota relatives at Standing Rock, there was no question that I would be among the many thousands that would go. The injustice and mistreatment of my brothers and sisters was a reminder of my people's great loss, and the threat against the Lakota was a continued threat against all indigenous people fighting to retain sovereignty, our way of life, and our future survival. What I experienced within this gathering of over 500 tribal nations and at times over 10,000 people were natives and allies resisting the further exploitation of this planet by living and working together in community. Through this mass gathering, we saw how we once lived and thrived by following traditional values and by working together in ceremony, in prayer, and with the love and respect for our Mother Earth. After many conversations about the next steps after Standing Rock, it was clear that continuing to build community was imperative if positive change was to happen. This led my family to continue the momentum of Standing Rock by creating an indigenous gathering and healing space for natives and allies to work together to find solutions to reverse the dependence on fossil fuel and to return to a traditional lifestyle that places us in harmony with nature. We call our community space Katanga, and this is our mission statement. Katanga is an indigenous healing retreat and cultural gathering place that was inspired by the collective work and community at Standing Rock. 
Katanga means place of the trees in the California native language Tongva. We promote indigenous sovereignty nationally and globally. We support and encourage revitalization of language, culture, spirituality, food sovereignty, and tradition. We work to break down the colonialist barriers and systems that have disconnected us from nature, our Mother Earth, and our ancestral way of life. Moving forward, I see community building as the key and the legacy of Standing Rock. I encourage you all to support the momentum of Standing Rock through your own participation in, in community building, however and wherever that might be. I'd like to close with an old Mexican proverb. They tried to bury us. They didn't know we were seeds. Standing Rock is a movement that will live on and continue as it has sown many seeds. I encourage all of us to be those seeds of change. I wish Konecha. It's been an honor to be here to speak with you about my experience at Standing Rock. Miniwachoni, water is life. Thank you. This will be interesting. There was a giant standing up here a little bit ago. <laughs> Where is that giant cedar? Um, I'm honored to present with these two ladies. Um, you've raised the bar high. Here's my presentation. So. <laughs> uh, first of all, I, I guess revel in the energy of the young people here at Evergreen and the other young people. To me, anything young is 40 and under. So those of you that are 45, you're elders now. So, and all the old school people that are in the room that have the same hair color as me, I uh, look forward to conversations with you because truly we have traveled an interesting road, right? Going back to the 60s, experiencing what we did, and then all of a sudden, uh, people once again, like the poem that Floris wrote, is that all of a sudden people have w awakened once again. It's a real good feeling. When um, the Standing Rock issue came up, it's real important to realize that this is a crescendo. This has been happening for a long time. On the Missouri River, uh, which we call Minishoshe, I heard Marlies talk about that, in the 90s, something really strange began to happen along the Missouri River. Uh, our graves started to raise. There were a lot of our relatives, we call them Wichanagi, they started to surface. So we began to look at that, and of course, with historical trauma, a lot of anger and rage, emotions came up, because once again, when the dams were put in along the Missouri River, the environmental racism targeted every single native community on the Missouri main stem. And a dam was put in every single native community, including mine. So I was born into this. When I was a year and a half, I saw them moving uh, a lot of our belongings off the, the old community of what we call Magaska. And I was a year and a half, and I couldn't figure out what was going on, but I could feel the sadness. I could feel the anger. And then at years later, and I'll talk about this tonight, you'll probably hear me repeat this, but it's important. When I was about 12 years old, I was sitting along that very same area where the, our community was wiped out. It was obliterated by the, the raising water. And I remember my dad looked at me and he said, my girl, you're gonna have to do something about this someday. And I thought, I'm 12 years old, what am I gonna do? And he said, you'll figure it out. And I thought, so I've been figuring it out since I was 12. So a lot has come to me, uh, including all of you. And I think that Standing Rock was that awakening, uh, that crescendo that came about when the Wichanaki started to surface along the Missouri River. I truly believe with our ceremonies, the guidance of many of the spiritual leaders, uh, which is all of us, we realized that they were coming to help us, that we weren't able to do some of this ourselves that they had, it had to be such a large presence that we had to pay attention because we got real hard heads and my grandma used to call me as a little girl, she'd say, Nina Nuchcha, she'd say, my girl, you have wooden ears. 
So a lot of us are nukcha. We don't listen very well, and we keep thinking that somebody else over in Tacoma is going to take care of it. But the reality is that each one of us has that personal responsibility. And now we do dissertations about historical responsibility, right? In ecological spaces, they're in terms now in academics. So now it's a little bit easier. We have names for them. But it all goes back to what's in your heart. So when Standing Rock, or before Standing Rock, when the KXL pipeline situation came in 2007, I, just, I first became aware of it on the treaty committee. And I remember thinking, ah, oh, I felt real tired because I thought I just knew this was going to be a big fight. I thought, dang it, there they go again, over and over and over again. And in my world, I have a list of uh, 100 things that I should be working on at the same time. A list of 100. So I have to say, OK, today or maybe this week, it's going to be this one. And then those other ones go boom, 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 boom. They, they come to the front. So in the list of 100, our treaty committee met. And we began to figure out how devastating what Cedar talked about with the tar sands coming. The awful amount of water that it would be utilizing for privatization, individual, corporate profit, which has nothing to do with most of you but it does impact you because it impacts your water source and your grandchildren. So when we mobilized, one of the things that we began to realize is that we lived in parallel universes because of our historical trauma. So in my home community, we didn't always talk to white people. The white people not, didn't always talk to us. We'd go to the post office and we'd kind of pretend to see each other. And if we'd see a native person, we'd say, oh, good morning. If we'd see a non-native person, we'd kind of look the other way. So when KXL came, we thought, well, you know, these ranchers are crying now, so maybe we ought to talk to them. They are actually being impacted like we were about land. So we reached out, and uh, we called some ranchers. I called them in Nebraska, and I invited them to come up. And it's been since 2013, and it's so nice to see Reuben and Cedar here because they came out. On January 25th, 2013, we signed the International Treaty to Protect the Sacred, which was to come together as First Nations and allies to stop the tar sands in 2013. And it was the 150-year anniversary of a treaty, a peace treaty that was signed between the Ponca, the Dakota, the Ihangtuan, and uh, the US government. So we felt that the US government had broken that peace treaty. So we revived it. We, uh, we committed to stand together. And here we are four years later still fighting the fight. Of course, they made some gains in Enbridge. We still continue with the prayers. KXL was done away with, as you know, with Obama. And now it's back on the table with the oppressors moving in. But the significance of that KXL movement is it created some really important networks that came to the surface with uh, Standing Rock. A lot of those networks across the nation had come together. And so all of a sudden, Standing Rock appeared on the stage and we were ready. Everybody came together and we thought, at least we know some protocols. What we didn't expect, of course, the 12,000 other people that decided to awaken, which was cool. It was just a delicious time to challenge your spirit. And challenge your spirit, it did. How many in this room were at Standing Rock? Can you stand up? Stand up. Give them a hand. OK. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Now, we don't want to build hierarchies. How many of you in the room prayed for Standing Rock? Stand up. Thank you, thank you. Prayer is just as important. Twitter, all those other things that you paid attention to during Standing Rock are just as important because you have that power to influence the person next to you. You have absolute power. Sometimes it's a little bit overwhelming for me on the plane when I get on, because I every time I talk to somebody, I have to do a workshop. So anymore, I just go to sleep on the plane. But there is that power in personal communication. And so when Standing Rock came up, I remember my kids set me down because my kids, my precious children, have grown up with me doing this, even when they were in spirit form. And so they came, they set me down, and they said, Ina, you're getting old. 
And you need to not be up there on the front line. So you just need to sit down. We'll get you a new chair. We'll get you a new camp chair. I said, okay. So they got me a new camp chair, went up to Standing Rock. But you know what? When you sit still, people can find you. <laughs> Before, I was flitting all over the place, doing this and doing that. And when I sat down as an elder, I was more accessible. So I made up my mind in the role of leadership, if you step into a place where you think that you are of use and of value, which is what you do when you're a leader, is you have to know what your role is. If you don't know what your role is, you can become a burden. You get in the way. So the thing that I learned out of Standing Rock, and I knew this before, and if you haven't learned it by watching, is if you go somewhere, you jump in your car and you go to a camp, figure out why you're doing that. Don't just become a burden. There were so many lost people that came to Standing Rock. And we prayed for them. But what that pointed out to me is that Euro America, all of the immigrants that came to this country, at Standing Rock, it made them lonesome for themselves. So if anything, the people who were non-native that came to Standing Rock, you were lonesome for the earth, you were lonesome for your roots, and now is the time to go back and trace the tribalism that you came from. That's very, very important. We need you to not be sad and weak. We need for you to be strong in your own tribalism. Of what, what, and know who you came for. But imagine how it makes me feel as a native person, and I see a person on the plane, and I say, where do you come from? Uh, I don't know. That's scary. I need for you to know where you came from. Because you have genetic memory. You have DNA. And otherwise, you end up wanting to become a native. And we already have enough natives to take care of. <laughs> we want you to be our ally, not our burden. That was an important learning. And I know that Sweetwater, are you here somewhere? She does trainings on decolonization, which is what we ended up doing at the camp. We had to do that because there were a lot of non-native people came, that came there that were looking for their heart and their spirit. And we just had to intervene. We had to intervene and say, there are certain protocols that we have to enforce here. But it was so large, it was difficult to do. The other thing that Standing Rock, we're talking about reverberations. Um, I think we learned, most importantly, how important a little tiny, itty bitty, microscopic town of Cannonball was, right? Cannonball had the first word, and they had the last word. They, this was the land that they're going to have to live on. So when people didn't follow the protocols, Cannonball spoke because they had a bigger fight. They had to fight the oil as they are now. And so when, you go, I, when I go places, I make the promise that I'm going to respect the locals. If I come here at Evergreen, one of the things that I need to do is, first of all, ask the spirits of this land to forgive my lack of knowledge of the spirits of this place and allow me to share these words in a good way with you today and to know my boundaries of what I can and can't do. That's the importance of Standing Rock because each one of you come from a place. In indigenous people, we see that in all your papers that we're a place-based society. Very important things where people have celebrated, had ceremony, and died the last ceremony of their life. And so you cannot possibly know that when you go to a new place unless someone takes that time to teach you. So when you walk into that community, ask for help. I don't know the way. What can I, and can I, and maybe you just wash dishes. Maybe you just cook. There were a lot of people that standing around that did that. It's really an honor to cook for the people because you're putting your heart in there. That was a big, big job at Standing Rock. I think as far as the, um, the role, when I went there, I saw so many things that needed to be done. I thought, now wait a minute, I'm recovering from codependency. <laughs> I can't save the world. I have to narrow down what it is I'm here for. So I went to where my heart is, and where my heart is is what, in what we call the Ocheti Shakoin, 
the seven council fires. So we have been devastated by historical trauma when the council fires was broken apart because of all the things that were outlawed in the safe, good, powerful way that we lived. So when we went up there and Chairman Archambault asked for elders to help him rebirth the Ocheti Shakoni, I took that seriously. I thought, I'm just going to try to listen to the spirit and see what it is I'm supposed to do. So when the fire was lit, the peta was lit, the horn was recreated. For those of you that don't know what the horn is, there is a structure of teepees in the center of the camp that symbolizes the horn of the buffalo. And the horn of the buffalo, when a storm comes, unlike cows, the buffalo will face its head into the storm. And that's what the horn is. So the teepees represented in the center place the horn that would withstand everything, anything, even to the ground. And so I um, define my place. I come from a grandmother who was a wakichunza, a peacemaker, and I knew the work that she did in our community, so I began, and then I realized that a lot of the young people that were asked to step up in leadership were, like me, very colonized. And so if we were going to recreate this dream of this rebirth of the horn, we had to not reify colonialism. We did not have to build more hierarchies and be exclusive and say, you weren't at Standing Rock, I was. Then we're just repeating history. So we began to uh, sit with the young men and women that were asked to step forward at the horn. And we spent many hours in those yurts in the teepees talking about what it meant to decolonize in the way of leadership in the Ocheti Shakoin. And of course, things were popping all over the place. There were direct actions, there was violence, there was peace, there was prayer, there was ceremonies. But it was a beautiful, beautiful gathering of people where we could be in this place to learn from each other. And so I think it's going to reverberate. I hope there are other standing rocks, but at the same time, as I travel into other communities, <laughs> I have to kind of chuckle because when they find out I'm from the Ocheti Shakoi, they'll say, tell them we don't want a camp like that <laughs> in our community because it was overwhelming. There were certain protocols that had to be established. So if you go to any of these camps, please go in a way of peace and learning because those were very painful experiences. The other reverberation that I think that is coming out of Standing Rock is a new way of looking at our veterans. Because our veterans are vict or how many veterans sit in the room? Okay. I um, honor the veterans in the room. I come from a family of veterans. And of course, my father told me, he said, do not let my grandchildren go into the military. He said, I know what happens there. I have major PTSD, and I have PTSD. But I learned from the veterans when they came what a beautiful experience it was for an army of PTSD veterans to join with a whole tribe of Indians that had major PTSD. It was beautiful. We knew what it means to be afraid. We know what it means to be angry. We knew what it means to be rageful. We know what it is to be in fear. And we were able to communicate at a level that you could never construct. And so I'm hoping, I've been asked to work with, I'm a PTSD therapist in the VA. I work with veterans all the time. And I think that we can do more in a positive way with the veterans who are now out of the military. There's work to be done. You weren't warrior for nothing. So, it's time to defend the earth, and so we're going to have some gatherings of veterans to figure out how do we parallel with other earth warriors who have not been in the military but are standing up for the earth, because you're all warriors, but you have to make that choice. So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, the majority of you are in the room, are young, so you've got a long career ahead of you. And I'm hoping to be recycled, and I want to see what you're doing 60 years from now. But I think um, we have made some breakthroughs with Standing Rock, and things are not the same anymore. 
the voices have spoken, and most importantly, um, the prayers have been laid. There are prayers out on that Missouri River that were laid by your canoes when you came. How many in here went down the Missouri River in canoes? Thank you for doing that. So those prayers are still traveling. I had the opportunity to go see, I worked with the Walker River Paiute in historical trauma, which is where Myron Dewey is from. Some of you know Myron from Digital Smoke Signals. When I went to Myron's land, I figured out why he was at Standing Rock. They called themselves the trout eaters, and guess what, there's no trout. Their lake has been killed by theft of the water from all the farmers upstream. Another killing of the water. So that's why Myron, like all of you that went there, you realize that there's a water war going on in each one of our communities. So those are the things, and you heard on the panel previous to us, um, all of it is about marketing and stealing water. It's all for privatization, and we have to, that's the last frontier. It really is the last frontier. So we have to defend that, and I think that's one thing that has changed forever. Uh, the other thing, I think that um, it's really interesting in a way that we have a president like we do because it allowed us to really see the cards that we're playing with, right? We see the full hand now. And we're good at counting cards, right? <laughs> we have casinos. <laughs> so what we have to do is we have to calculate how are we going to play that game. But we're going to need all of you to do that regardless of race because the other thing that the oppressors have done is they've racialized us. They've taught us not to trust each other. So we're going to have to examine that with each one of you. Why are you fearful of other races? What is your experience? And how can we transcend that? We had some really interesting discussions late into the night with some of the people from Black Lives Matter up at Standing Rock, way late into the night during the snowstorm. And we realized how much the government has racialized us against each other. So somehow we have to heal before we can stand together. So the, the number one biggest, great, big, giant thing that happened at Standing Rock was it was a giant ceremony of healing for everybody who came. And when you walked into the camp, you felt it. I talked to a girl from, um, I think she was Ojibwe, and she said something to me that was kind of uh, really eye-opening to me. She said, there's two places in my life that I felt safe. She said one was Sundance and the other was Standing Rock. And I said, why? What was it? And she's light. So somebody racialized her and will make fun of her and say, you're not really native because you look like a white person. She faced that all her life. And she said, when I went to Standing Rock, they didn't do that to me. I was who I was. So we learned some things about being tribal village people again. And uh, I guess I'll close my part on the panel with remembering that we have these alliances and these understandings with Mother Earth that we forget about. And I'll talk about that tonight. But the biggest one at Standing Rock was the day that we found out that the EIS was going to be granted. And it went all through the camp and everybody was celebrating. Guess who else celebrated? Mother Earth. She wrapped herself in a white shawl and she celebrated for four days with this huge major blizzard that incapacitated everybody. That was a blessing. It caused us to put up with each other in even closer proximity at the casino, at the camp. It really tested us. We were there and I remember something that one of my grandfathers told me. He said, when you signed up for this, did you think you wouldn't be tested? And there were some people who, didn't, who couldn't do the test. I saw that happening. But you have other opportunities to do that if you weren't able to handle the test there. Because we've got a lot of work to go do. The water, um, you know, there's communities that are marginalized that are losing their home because of the ice melting. I just worked with some communities recently, and that's really frightening. They're losing their entire homes 
Everything is going. So, but it's not, not all gloom and doom because the crazy thing when you're in a state of oppression and you have that list of 100, you always have time to have fun and laugh, right? You think of all the crazy things that happened up at Standing Rock. I mean, you could laugh for days and days about all the crazy, ridiculous things that happen. And enjoy it, because um, we've been given, I think we all have a divine plan, and you came here for a reason, just like you came here this afternoon. Somehow we intersected. So I'm looking forward to seeing what you're going to do, uh, all these young people. Like I said, I'm a recovering classroom teacher, a recovering principal. I was a basketball coach about 100 pounds ago. So I know we're going to have good teamwork. Thank you. Thank you uh, for those inspiring words from all of the panelists. We're going to open this up to a uh, question and discussion right now. Um, and what we would like to do is we'd like to offer the opportunity for those who have been at Standing Rock to start us off. You can either share an experience if you want or a question. Uh, we have Haley right over there um, with the microphone. So if you can just raise your hand, Haley will come and um, uh, let you um, either share your experience or ask a question. Um, my name is Mariana Harvey. I'm from the Yakma Nation. I live in Olympia. And thank you to all of you for your words and faith. It was such an honor to just really... You, there was a video that Tracy Rector did of you um, when I think that snowstorm had hit. And, and it captured uh, exactly what part of what, what you shared about um, uh, just that encouragement for, for people who are not native to really seek their, their own uh, tribes and, and where they're from. And it, that really impacted me because as a native person, uh, it, it can be really challenging to, to just navigate sometimes our own spaces and you look around and you're in a sweat, and you look around and you're in your longhouse, you look around and you're out of a native event and you're still the minority. Um, and that, that really touched me. And I feel like I've tried to, because I think that it's really, unity is really important. And like, like you said, you know, we, there needed to be that many people there. We needed that, those many hearts and prayers there. Um, but nonetheless, like, um, the way you shared that really helped me. So I just wanted to say thank you. And, and I guess one of my um, experiences at Standing Rock, I got to go um, like the first week in November. And a lot of my, I work for the Native Youth Leadership Alliance. We're a national organization that serves Native youth uh, in leadership development through, uh, mostly through a fellowship for tribal college students. We, we just meet young people where they're at and wrap around as much love and support and connection to resources, seed funding, to really support them in what they wanna do in their lives. And, and we had a lot of community there. A lot of our Native Youth Leadership Alliance community was there and they housed me and took care of me. And, um, and it just felt like a family. I remember just like, I felt like anywhere I was at in camp, if I looked right, I looked left, I felt confident to just say hello and, and introduce myself and, and everyone's story was powerful. Everyone had this deep purpose of being there. And, and like myself, like I, as soon as things really um, caught momentum and you know, my tribe went out there, like the, all those canoes went out there and I was like, I gotta go, I gotta go and it, and it just, um, my own responsibilities, the own, my own things, it took a long 
time to, to really make it happen. And everybody just kept saying, just pray about it. Just put it in a prayer. And, and I did. And, and it just sort of lined up. Um, and, and one of, uh, one of my favorite stories of, of this, everyone's story was powerful, but this one gentleman, um, like Faith was sharing that like, you know, as soon as you entered the camp, you, you felt it. And one of my first days there, I met this gentleman who was First Nations and he, I don't remember what province he came from, but he walked there. And I met him right when he came through and, and he was really emotional, but um, he was sharing a story. He said that there was two of them. The one friend was determined to walk and then the other friend was like, I can't let you walk alone, I'm gonna come. And, um, and they, when they went through customs or the, the border, the border told them, uh, you only have 48 hours. And, and if you don't come back across the border within that 48 hours, you're gonna be labeled as an eco-terrorist. And, and he said, that's fine, I'm still going, I have to go. He was overwhelmed and he knew he had to go and he knew he had to walk. And, and so when he came through, the um, the gate to the main camp, he said he he just fell in emotion. He started just crying and he 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 uh, couldn't couldn't control it. It was just the spirit just took took over him. And people came and helped him and held him up. And and then I got to hear his story right after that. And it just that wasn't unique. And that was the beautiful thing is that wasn't unique. There were so many people. And I just feel so grateful to have been able to go there and, and pray, uh, pray there, to pray for that water and, and, and for that awakening because I came back and I was still living in Tacoma. And then I, you know, I kept hearing about the LNG and just thinking about, and you know, I was aware of like Cherry Point and, and went to different uh, community gatherings, but um, we're really focused on our homes and I feel, so uh, driven by that, that fierceness and that beauty that was there to just really stand with, with all, of, all of you to really defend our earth. So thank you for your, for your words today, all of you. Ayaku. Greetings, relatives. It is so good to be gathered here on these Medicine Creek Treaty lands, back home at Evergreen. My name is Zephyr Elise. I attended Evergreen State College here from 2010 to 2012. It is good to be back in this long house that was home for so long. Thank you, hands lifted, to the ancestors that brought us here, to each of you who came today to be here gathered. I thank uh, my elders on this panel for sharing their good words, their medicine, both at the camp and for each of the talks they've given thereafter. On September, I joined at Ocheti Shakoin, not knowing why ancestors had called me from the Ohlone lands where I'd been fighting the KXL pipeline with the Ohlone relatives for five years down there after Evergreen. And when I arrived at Ocheti Shakoin, the two spirit relatives who had started the Weon camp a safe space for women, children, and two spirits and their families at Ochete Shakoui in late August. They asked me to oversee it if I would stay the winter. Since I had come with 12 cents in my pocket and a summer tent and not knowing what else I was going to do, I was grateful that all the connections of the world came together there at a camp known as Standing Rock. Many in this community helped our camp to flourish in those early beautiful days in September and October when the protests were peaceful and prayerful in every way and eagles came to join and watch over us. And one experience I would love to share in my time that was both beautiful, profound, a ceremony of life and resistance, but terribly difficult also in keeping up with what we were called to do. Let me recount a moment where we stopped the pipeline from digging into this grandmother earth that we share, simply by asking the land to become as it once was, indigenous and full of life. 
And in that moment, we went out and set foot onto this grandmother, gently, prayerfully, respectfully, carrying bags and bags and bags of willow shoots to go back to the land that had been so misused, first as pasture, then as field, once again as a pathway to a pipeline that was gonna bring destruction. And with permission and with song and with breath, hundreds of people laid those shoots into that pipeline. And in a way that isn't celebrated in the news because our brown and red and black and white bodies were not being abused that day, we did shut down construction on that part. It was moments like those that Ochetti taught us there is another way to bring about and turn this universe back to a balance. It does not always have to be the backwater bridges that I was also witness to. So I thank the elders who led us in that prayerful way and taught us how to respect protocol. I thank all the relatives of the Salish Sea nations who taught me as a young thing in the 80s and returning again in my 30s how to walk in a good way. I thank my canoe family, the Pahi Woven family of the Tongva Nation in Soquel for bringing me up here, preparing me to go a mere two weeks after we return from journey. And I thank you all for being here to listen to these words. All my relations. Who, 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 who? Maybe, uh, is this, can we ask questions of the panel? Cool. So, uh, my name is Riel Laplan of the Blackfeet Nation. I am a master's in teaching student here at the Evergreen State Ta College's master's in teaching program. And uh, one of the questions I have relates to tribal sovereignty and, you know, activism. So, you know, what is, how does one engage in being a war protector while at the same time respecting tribal sovereignty? And to give some context for this question, uh, within my own reservation, for example, they had the passing of the Blackfeet Water Compact, which was very controversial. And what we had seen was a lot of people from outside the community just making heavy comments like, oh my God, that's such a bad thing. Don't let that happen. That's terrible. But in a way that undermines our sovereignty as native people because we're having these outside individuals come in saying how we should handle our own business. So what are ways that water protectors can engage in this very powerful and very important advocacy work while at the same time respecting the rights of the indigenous people and their land and their rights? And also another question, this aside, how do you spot fake news? I think that was like a big, that was a big thing uh, surrounding, you know, uh, you know, uh, the, the entire movement the, in Cannonball. And you just seen a lot of propaganda out there. And how do you sift between the, the genuine articles and the non-genuine? So I guess two questions, I'm sorry. It's two. Okay. Um, in regard to your first question, of course, I'm not familiar, so I defer to people who are from here because I'm not familiar with your water compact at all. But in the KXL movement, what we tried to do is educate, educate, educate as much as possible because people can't do what they don't know. And so, and then to have um, allies who are willing to educate their own allies. So the power of what we did with the Cowboy Indian Alliance, and we, a lot of the people who were the cowboys would not listen to me, but they would listen to their own people. So I think those are one of the lessons that we're learning is what does it mean? And I know there's pros and cons about being an ally. That's kind of a, a loaded word. But at the same time, if you have a common purpose, you do have a responsibility to be educated about the matter. Because we live in a gratification society where we just see something on Facebook and we share it and we don't even know what it means. That can be real dangerous because people are influenced by that. So I think it's a personal responsibility to become as educated as you can about these issues. And it may seem like a burden, but for me it's liberating because I don't need to be as afraid as I was before. It's like, okay, I, I sort of understand that. What does this have relationship to? And the other thing is that I think in the native world, 
being a sovereign means that we had unilateral relationships with government to government with the United States. So we're not like a state. We're not like a town or a township. And so the supremacy clause, which is Article 6 in the Constitution, is that treaties are the supreme law of the land. So having said that, we heard Cedar, the young man, talk earlier about unceded territory. There are parts of our land where treaties were never signed. We're in occupied territory. There is so much layer, there are so many layers of history that it would behoove non-native people to learn about that, and especially native people, because when you learn your own history, you begin to be liberated. One of the first books to read uh, is um, Lies My Teacher Told Me. I think most of you probably, that's been around for a long time. But you do have to know about the lies that you've been told, because they're not true. And so if, um, and we face that all the time. I, the young man here that talked about the curriculum that you have in the state of Washington, that's a huge thing. We have one like that in South Dakota. It's called the Ocheti Shakoni Standards. It's taken us years to get to that point. So in order for this country to be liberated, we do have to learn about the Holocaust that was created in this country. And we have to not repeat those same mistakes by assuming that we are smarter or know something better than the indigenous populations. Because we come from a very old uh, population. We've been here a long, long time. And the archeologists keep changing the date, right? Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Uh, I don't know about the second question. Do you remember his second what question? What was the second question? <laughs> Probably the most important one was fake the first news. question. Oh, about fake news. Yeah. Fake news? Um, do you have anything about that? Is this on here? I can't tell. Um, well, I, I have to say that I've had to um, use restraint, definitely, whenever I see some articles and not be so quick to, to jump. Judge. Um, I learned that, and um, so that's the only thing I can offer regarding that is that you just have to back off and research and, and find out whether it is actually, you know, true or not. So I think restraint is good. <laughs> I would like to respond, though, to your question in, in a kind of a humorous situation. When I was um, uh, given that electoral vote by that wonderful man here from the state of Washington, yeah. I got a call from the Los Angeles Times, and he said, uh, Ms. Spotted Eagle, how do you feel about the uh, television station in Seattle thinking that you were an imaginary person? And so I called my son and I said, they said I'm an imaginary person. And he said, Mom, you live in a different reality. You probably are imaginary <laughs> <laughs> to them. <laughs> And when I saw the notice, I did think it was fake news. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was uh, Puyallup tribal member uh, Robert Satayakum that voted for her mm -hmm. for president of the United right. States. Mm -hmm. So let's give Robert Satayakum a hand. <laughs> That was bravery on his part, and I agree with what Faith said about educating ourselves about the place where we live. Tyson was presenting when I first walked in. That's uh, my daughter, Heather and Skye, is uh, vice president of their nation, the Quinault Nation. They have the largest amount of beachfront property of any reservation in the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, about us, our Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota people, um, one of the things I became aware of since Standing Rock happened was uh, an 1805 treaty where the United States was only 30 years old, less than 30 years old, they, um, <clears throat> they asked for permission to be recognized as a sovereign because they were getting prepared to fight the British-American War. And they wanted uh, our Sioux nations to be neutral. So at that time, they recognized us as a power, which is we kinda, it's a different situation now. But I also learned something over there about this word, mini wichoni and that had to do with uh, a water project that, goes, goes, that happens at the Oglala Nation. The Oglala Nation has the on-off switch 
for a water system that provides water to over 50,000 South Dakota residents. And the people that benefit from that water is the Lower Brule, Rosebud, and Pine Ridge. I didn't know that. That's a powerful situation. And the rest of them are non-Indians. So there's, of those populations, I believe that's probably 10,000 maybe Indians and 40,000 non-Indians. And um, I wish they would do a test <laughs> in, in case the water system gets polluted, send all notices from the Oglala Nation that we're doing a test with the water system in case the like, water gets polluted. How long will it take? Do you, you know what I'm saying? Because I don't think people realize how connected we are, especially 40,000 non-Indians that didn't agree to support the Sioux Nations down there. Um, I, I, got, I hope this ends up being a funny story, but there's this guy named uh, Quiltman. You guys know who Quiltman is? He's uh, one of the backup singers. He's a Warm Springs Nation, and he's a really great Indian singer, and he sings backup for uh, John Trudell. And um, we were over there, and he had a set of golf clubs. So I said, hey, let's play some golf. So Ocheti Shaku and camp. So we played marbles. So we threw one golf ball out there, and then we hit the other golf ball, tried to hit the other one, right? So we went all the way through camp. All these Indian kids are riding around on horses, and it's just beautiful. We're right there by the river, and that was in September. And then um, one time, one of us hit the ball, and uh, the ball went under this pickup with New York license plates. And uh, so we walked over there, and it was these Iroquois holding his Shoney. And uh, he said, hey, you guys got to move your pickup out of the way of our golf course. <laughs> and they said, what are you talking about? I don't know if you guys know the history of some of our, our movements, but Oka was a big thing in 1990. They overturned some uh, vehicles, and there was an RCMP that, that was shot, and uh, there was a Mohawk on top of a vehicle. It all had to do with Oka. And here we are, Standing Rock, telling the Mohawks to get out of our way for our golf course. So that's all I want to say. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we have a student, Marina, from our program. Uh, Marina, would you like to come up? Hi there, everyone. Um, I just wanted to say it's been an honor to hear um, our presenters, water protectors, activists, and hear about their work, as well as hear as uh, audience members and the stories that they've come to tell us. Um, so I'd like to present a gift now from Alma Barton of the Macaw Nation. Let's give our panel another hand, please. So I would like to encourage everyone and remind everyone that Faith will be speaking again tonight at 7 o'clock. Um, we do have a dinner uh, break right now, um, and so there should be enough time for people to uh, uh, go um, to Olympia. There's also some things on campus that are in your program as well. Um, I'd also just like to... Um, uh, Highlight tomorrow as well. We also have a number of things that are going on tomorrow. Um, again, talking about advocacy, and Sweetwater will be giving a workshop tomorrow um, afternoon as well. So we hope that you will come back um, this evening, and um, it may be time for a more uh, robust conversation with Faith as well. But thank you again for coming. <laughs> 